Good evening and welcome to Reference Point. I'm your host, Dave Cokerhook. And this evening we're going to be talking about a subject that I think is very important here in Silicon Valley. We're going to be talking about copyrights, trademarks, and patents. And with me this evening is Marjorie Cameron. Marjorie is with the San Jose, excuse me, the Sunnyvale Public Library, and you've been involved with patent and trademark activities for quite some time, isn't that correct? Well, that's right. I started with patents back in 91, and I started showing people how to do a patent search. But I think what we're going to talk about today is intellectual property in general, and there's so many aspects to intellectual property. And I th that's a very good way of positioning it, intellectual property, because here these days you know, there's so many people doing things with the internet, uh, um, blogs, and, and writing e-books, and writing software, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a tremendous amount of information, especially for small businesses or independent contractors, that if they don't understand this copyright, trademark, and patent information, they could be at a disadvantage. So tell us a little bit. Let's ta start talking about copyrights. What is a copyright, really? Well, a copyright really affords protection for the author of original works. So, for example, a song. It could be actually a recording as well as just the, the lyrics of a song. Okay. It could be a CD. It could be a DVD. But it's, it's actually the work, the original works of the author. It could be a book. It could be a poetry. Mm -hmm. It could be recipe, a book of recipes okay. completely. It could be software. It's just amazing. It could be a sculpture. It could be a photograph. And these you might can copyright be copyright a photograph. Yes, you certainly can. And also, it could be a website. Ah. A web page could be copywritten. In fact, you've probably noticed it when you've been online. You can sure. see down at the bottom, copyright 2007, sure. etc. And so, copyright could also be for advertising materials. It could mm -hmm. be for a box. The the design, the on, design a box on a box. Okay. That has a product in it. So now. If you've created something like that, you've written a work or whatever, what do you have to do to go through the process of getting it copyrighted? Well, actually, copyright exists the moment the work is created. Ah. However, it might be to the person's advantage, to the author's advantage, to actually go through the process of getting a registration for copyright. Okay. And what that means is that they would simply take a form, and they're available on the copyright website at okay. www.copyright.gov. Okay. And simply find the form for the type of work it is, fill out the form, send it into the Library of Congress. It's mm. not to the Patent and Trademark Office, it's actually the Library of Congress mm -hmm. with $45. And then they, they get a registration back in about three weeks or so. So there is a fee for that registration activity. Yes, you know, there what's is. the value of having done a registration? Without the registration, if someone did infringe on your copyright, you would not be able to take them to court. Ah. You need a registration in order to get, go to court with a copyright ownership. Okay. And that's something that's federally uh, regulated. Registered. Okay. Yes. Oh, very now, you can certainly um, have an unpublished work that's copywritten as well, okay. as well as a published work. Well, explain what you mean by that published work versus an unpublished work. Well, for example, um, you could have it. You could have written it down, uh -huh. um, but it's never been published. You could have a drawing that you want to copyright. Oh, okay. And it maybe it's never been published. You can still so you've apply just done for it and it's hanging in, in, in at your house, but yes. you've never done anything with it. But, yes. but the the moment that you created it, it is copyrighted and it belongs yes. to you, and no one else is able to utilize that, right? Yes, but now remember, copyright is 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 exactly the way it is. In other words, if you take a drawing and there's a slight change, mm -hmm. that could be someone else's creation too. Okay, so let's uh, uh, let's uh, uh, point this in the direction of the of the business person, you know, a small c contractor or or uh, you know a startup business or whatever. How important is it for a small business to to protect their intellectual property in this way? It's probably a good idea, even with copyright, to to uh, apply for it. If you have advertising materials, say you have a multimedia presentation that you put money into, mm -hmm. quite a bit of money into, you might want to copyright that. Okay. And then, so once that's done and once that's registered, should someone else uh, attempt to use some or all of what it is that you've created, you have some recourse then, Exactly, right? okay. exactly. 
Now, there's a lot of legal ramifications on these types of things, and neither of us are attorneys. So if, if, if the folks out there have some uh, specific things that they need or some information that they, that they require, they really ought to speak to uh, an attorney. Right, Absolutely. That, that specializes in either copyright or patent or trademark Absolutely. law. Absolutely. And what's really wonderful, if, if the person is an artist, mm -hmm. there's something called Califer California Attorneys for the Arts, mm -hmm. and that they can look that up on the web and take a look there and perhaps get help that way. Okay. And that's a local organization, I believe you mentioned. Too, There's a San it? Francisco. San Francisco, California group. Attorneys for the Arts. So that's, and, and there are a lot of artists around here too, both from a music perspective and the drawing, you know, people yes. who design all kinds of things. So, yes. well, that's very interesting, and I appreciate that information because that's something that I've been aware of for a long time that was a good idea, but I wasn't exactly sure how to go about dealing with it. And I, knowing that it's all automatic is a good thing to know. And the registration seemed like a very reasonable thing to do. Now, one other thing that if you, the copyright owner could put a notice of copyright on the work. It's not required, but they certainly could put a notice. That's the circle that's with the C. That's the C with a circle and around it. The year it. in which you did it. The year and the owner's the name. Owner's name. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. That might be a good thing to do. Well, why don't we move on to trademarks then? Because trademarks and copyrights are vastly different from each other. So if we take a look at a trademark, what, what actually is, is a trademark? Well, a trademark is, it could be a design, it could be words, it could be symbols, it can actually be colors, sounds, smells. It you is, can trademark a smell? <laughs> well, there actually was a trademark smell. I only know of one for plumeria blossoms for embroidery thread. Ah. That's no longer um, being used, but <laughs> it's sort of exciting to think that that's true. But what it really does, what a trademark does, is it identifies and distinguishes the source of goods or services in the marketplace. So it's going back, it's identifying the company or the maker of those goods and, oh, okay. and the owner of those services. Okay. And is there a distinction, because I've heard both of these terms used, trademark and service mark, and is there a distinction between a trademark and a service mark? Well, generally people think of a trademark for a product okay. and a service mark for a service. Okay. But trademarks, in a sense, are both trademarks and service marks. Okay. It's sort of an So it's umbrella. kind of an umbrella yeah. term. Okay, good. And so is there a distinction? I think you actually mentioned this to me before the show, that there is a distinction between federally registered trademarks and state registered trademarks. Is that correct? Well, there are actually three kinds of trademarks, federal, state, and common law. Ah. And now that's in the United States. Okay. In the United States, you can actually have a trademark simply by using it. Is that the common that's law? That's the common law trademark. You don't have to register it anywhere. You don't have to worry about renewing it. You simply have it by dint of using it. However, there are, can be some problems with that. How do you prove when you used it? Mm. How do you prove how wide your marketing area is? Sure. So there can be problems. Sure. Now, a state trademark would be, for example, in California, if you're doing business just in California, you would probably be interested in a, trade, in a state trademark, mm -hmm. in a California state trademark. You wouldn't be eligible for a federal trademark if you were doing business just in California. Oh, really? You must be doing business across state lines or internationally. Okay. In other words, businesses that, commerce that's regulated by Congress. Okay, so any interstate commerce activity, if yes. you have a trademark, then you're able to have a federally registered trademark. Then. You may apply you for may a federal. You may but you may not get it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You may apply for a federal trademark. Okay. And what is that process like? Well, you. It's, um, you can actually apply online. In fact, the tra Patent and Trademark Office would like you to, to apply online electronically. Mm -hmm. It makes it a lot easier for their office okay. um, to deal with the application. Mm -hmm. And you pay $325 to apply online. There's actually, you can actually use Tease Plus, which is their trademark electronic system for filing. And if you um, if you satisfy certain requirements, you can actually pay 275 but you may have to end up paying the extra $50 <laughs> if you haven't satisfied these specific requirements. Okay. So you pay 325 and you file your form, and you may very well want to go to a trademark attorney before you do this. Mm -hmm. um, you probably want to do a search before you do anything. Right. 
Um, and how do you go about and doing that? Now, there are, there are many places that you can do free searching. The okay. first one would probably want to be the federal um, database, which okay. is called TESS, the Trademark Electronic Search System, okay. which is on the Patent and Trademark Office website. Okay. And that's www.uspto.gov. Okay. And then people can look on there and go to the search system and do a trademark search. Now, oh, okay. one of the difficulties there's of doing a trademark search is oftentimes people think, well, if I don't get the exact words, I'm okay. Sure. If it's a little bit different, then nobody's yes. going to care. But that's and the way it works, is it? Not at all. Say we're looking for Aunt Chunky's cookies, uh -huh. and we find Uncle Chunks, and they happen to be for cookies or baked goods. You're probably not going to get a trademark registered for Aunt Chunkies. Because it's, it's really too, too close. close. Too okay. close. And maybe that company could easily be making an Aunt Chunkies, too. Sure. I mean, you could think about it for yourself, too. You probably don't want to be confused with that company either. Right. So it's, it's for the benefit of the, the marketplace as well as the, the company. Yes. So now, how long does a trademark last? Or once you get one, is it just yours forever? Well, it could be as long as you do all of the paperwork that you need to do over the life of the trademark. Ah. So, for example, if you file for a trademark and it registers, mm -hmm. it's good for 10 years. Okay. However, between the fifth and sixth year, you must say that you're still using the mark. And a lot of trademark owners forget to do that. Mm -hmm. And if they fail to do that, they lose their federal registration. Now. When they, if they've done that, they also get one opportunity to, to file for something called incontestability, okay. which makes their mark really strong. So they're able to, able to do it yes. again now. Only one time. Then after 10 years, if they're using their mark continuously for 10 years, they can reapply to renew the mark. So, so it's pretty much a 10-year cycle, but you have to re uh, apply to renew it and prove that you've been using it uh, at the end of that during well, uh, uh, within an affidavit that saying you're using okay, it. Yes. that's great. Now, companies who have not managed to, who have not protected their trademarks, or, or things can get into what I guess is called the public domain. I know of a heard of a couple examples. I think we talked about this too. I remember mm -hmm. um, um, Kleenex used to be the default term for facial tissue, and then they went through a big process to uh, uh, change that. And Xerox was another one. It used to, and mm -hmm. now it's uh, photocopying because when Xerox first came out, there really weren't any other copy machines. They just called them Xerox copies. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so if you don't do the work and take and, and put forth the uh, effort to protect your trademark, you can actually lose that, right? And it becomes public domain. Is that correct? Yes. Use it correctly or lose it. Use it or lose it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but w the difficulty, right, it can go into, um, as you said, into public use, public domain. And there are many trademarks that have done that, aspirin, for example. Sure. And as you said, these two trademarks that almost, that almost, almost happened, yeah. too. Escalator is another oh, one. Oh, sure, right. <laughs> but the other thing that it's important to do, and Sometimes trademark owners are reluctant to do this, and that is to actually challenge someone who starts using their mark mm. in commerce. Okay. And sometimes trademark owners really don't. They say, well, Why I guess it's I all right that? with me, but that's not usually yeah. advisable. And that's where you really want to refer to your trademark attorney. So let's talk about patents a little bit now, because patents were, were very interesting, some of the things you were telling me about patents, because I guess there were actually different kinds of patents, and I wasn't fully aware of that until you mentioned it to me the other day. Yes, there are actually three kinds of patents. Okay. Um, there are design patents. Design patents, And okay. design patents are for ornamental designs. Like this. Yes. Okay. Yes. And um, that's really basically what it is, how it looks. Okay. Not the way it works, an ornamental design of a product. It could be the shoe upper, or it could be the tread on your shoes. Okay. In the 30s, there were a lot of design patents for silverware. Oh, okay, so, sure. And I've seen a lot of inline skate design patents, just different kinds of inline skates, the way they look, okay. not the way they work. All right, so the way it looks is the design patent. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what's another type? Well, another type, this is an example of a plant patent. A plant patent. For an asexually reproduced plant. So you can actually patent a plant. You can, yes. In fact, there's strawberries. We have down in Watsonville, we have quite a few patents coming out of Watsonville for strawberries. Really? Mm -hmm. I've actually seen a mushroom plant patent. Now, does yes. that have anything to do with genetic engineering? Not at all. 
Not at all. I mean, there are also utility patents, which is our third kind of patent, okay. um, which would probably include the, the bacteria that will eat up oil spills and right, <laughs> things like sure. that. Yes, but uh, yes, these are for asexually reproduced plants. They must be um, presented in color. Uh, okay. The Patent and Trademark Office. Okay. And then the third type of patent is? The third type of patent is a utility patent. Okay. And that's for any new and useful and unobvious machine. Okay. Article of manufacture. Okay. Process. Usually it's a chemical process. Would this be uh, what this one is on, was this is a. This is an example. Of a utility patent? Of a utility patent. Okay. And... This patent, actually there are no, two is patents it, is on it this. Is it the leg that's patented or? Well, no? I think we've probably all seen the leg um, in department stores. This is where they're playing hosiery. But this is actually a method of making decorated hose. And it's also tattoo hosiery having translucent ink. Okay. So there are actually two patents on this. But it's basically the method of making them. Okay. For multicolored decoration and for a way to make the decoration that's so that it appears as a tattoo on the skin of the wearer okay. under the hose. So it's, it's the manner in which they apply the, the ink and it's the type of ink and the effect that it creates. That was what the patent it's was. It's the whole for. process the whole of pat making the hose. Oh, of making okay. this kind of, of making this decorated hose. Making, okay. Yes. And the people are actually local. They're actually from Watsonville too who did oh, this patent. Oh, well, cool. And you use the resources at the at, Sunnyvale, at the Sunnyvale Public Library, Library, which we're going to talk Library. about in a couple of minutes because there's some tremendous resources available there. But you brought something that was very interesting that I wanted to let everybody see, and that is you brought a copy of the first U.S. patent. This is exciting. This patent is from 1790, 1790, and it's a method for making potash and pearl ash. Okay. And it's by Samuel Hopkins from Philadelphia. But what's sort of exciting about this, now this is blown up, obviously we put it on our wall. Oh. <laughs> but um, it's signed by George Washington. Okay. Also, you'll see um, Randolph here, who was the Attorney General at the time. Okay. And also Thomas Jefferson's Jefferson. signature at the bottom. Very cool. Now. Aren't these typically numbered? Is, uh, isn't a patent usually have they assign a number to a patent? This is the first patent. However, if you wanted to search it on the Patent and Trademark Office website, you'd have to search it with an X1 okay. because the first patents were unnumbered. Oh, okay. It only started in the 1830s that they started numbering patents. Okay. Now, patents, what's the length of time that a patent is good for? Well, right now, a patent is... Um, the term is 20 years from the application date. 20 years from the application date? Yes. Okay. And then what happens after that? Then it, anyone can make and use it. Oh, okay. The invention. So, so it, it's, mm -hmm. it's a 20-year it period that makes it possible for the inventor to take the greatest advantage of his creative work um, from a, you know, to market it, to uh, license it to others, or whatever. And, but then after that period, then it becomes you know, pretty much open and, uh, and anyone else can go for it. Now, is there a way to extend a patent in any you way? You can't really extend it, but I know that patents can be improved. That's another thing that, that are utility patents. Mm. So there could be an improvement on a patent. Okay. For example, inline skates were invented back in the 40s. Sure. But there have been many inline skate patents and utility patents too, not just design patents, how they look, but actually uh, improvements in how they work. Oh, okay, okay. So For you, example, could, you could have, uh, be the one who patented an item and then do some further development and research and about the time that the one is uh, expiring, you could submit for another one. And, okay. Yes. So now, one of the things that um, is very interesting to me is how we are more and more involved in a global market. Okay, yeah. so what happens for an American company or an individual who copyrights patents or trademarks something here in the States? How does that translate into protection overseas? Well, when they're doing it in the U.S., they're really that isn't being recognized anywhere else except in the U.S. Okay, if a person wanted to patent an invention in another country, they would have to patent it in the country they were interested in being 
having the rights in that country. You have to go to each individual so, country? Well, it depends. We, we have treaties with a number of countries. For example, there's something called the Patent Cooperation Treaty. Okay. So that an inventor in the U.S. could apply in the U.S. and then apply to this world body. Mm. And that application, that world application, never becomes a patent. But it could be used as a jumping off application in other countries if he wanted to extend his rights to other countries. Okay, so by virtue of having done it here and being involved with this convention or the, uh, this international body, he has uh, a better opportunity to extend it to other countries if he chooses to. Is well, the countries that are members to that treaty. Now, if he wanted right. to, if he wanted to patent it in countries that were not, not members to that treaty, treaty he, he would have to go individually, individually to, those to those countries. Okay. But sometimes there, certainly, you can see how there would be an advantage of having one world type application. Everyone's a member and sort of is in somewhat agreement mm -hmm. about that, and they can use that application as a jumping off one. And the same is, uh, is that also true of trademarks? Trademarks is a little bit different, but there is an international trademark um, register. Mm. And then those marks, we do belong now to the Madrid Protocol. That became effective just in 2003, okay. November and of 2003. Let everybody know what the Madrid but, Protocol is. Well, it's, it's another treaty, um, you might say, with other countries. Okay. And it means that that it makes it easier, I guess you could say, to apply for trademark protection in other countries. So the, the Madrid now, Protocol is specifically for trademarks, though? Yes, definitely okay. for trademarks. And if you're concerned about trademarks, if you're doing trademark searches, you definitely want to check the Madrid Protocol register, Okay. that database. Because then because if, those if, marks could appear on that register before they come into the U.S., but they would have priority application dates. Because of, is because of the treaty. In, in other, other words, words if I apply for a mark, it works both ways. If sure. I applied for a mark in the U.S. Yes. on a certain date, mm -hmm. and then I went through Madrid, the Madrid Protocol, and wanted to apply in other countries, mm -hmm. it'd probably appear on that international register before it would appear in the databases of the other countries. Okay, sure. Sure. And then if someone from another country had registered a trademark, it would appear in the database. And if someone from the U.S. was thinking, oh, well, I've got this trademark, I want to try to utilize it in the U.K. or in Germany or whatever, and they, it was already uh, in the database, then that would be a, a problem. Well, it might also be a problem because if that, if that mark is going to come into the U.S., oh, right. it could be a problem in the U.S. too. Sure. So it's sort of puts the person a little bit on notice of what's going on. So it does make an awful lot of sense if you're doing any kind of business internationally and you have a trademark that you're going to utilize or you want to register to definitely go to the, um, check that out with the Madrid Well, protocol. even if you're going to just file a U.S. trademark, you want to check uh -huh. the, the international database because, as I said, those marks could come into the U.S. Oh, that's true. And their priority date Right, right. So if they put it in prior to when you tried to uh, register yours, then you could find yourself uh, unable to get that trademark because it was perhaps, in the yeah, perhaps. Um, now, if you're going for, and that's another time when you definitely want to talk to a trademark attorney. Sure, sure. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the uh, Sunnyvale Library, though, because one of the, it, it's. It was amazing to me, I was over at the library several weeks ago, and, and the resources that you have available for people who are looking to uh, do any kind of trademark or patent uh, activity uh, were surprising and, and quite extensive. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about what it is that you're able to do for people. Well, what's really wonderful about Sunnyvale is we're one of five patent and trademark depository libraries in California. There's one in San Francisco, one in Sacramento, we, we're there in Sunnyvale, was one in San Diego, and one in LA, the Los Angeles Public Library. Mm -hmm. And all patent depository libraries have certain um, collections um, and make certain uh, databases available to the public. Mm -hmm. So, for example, at Sunnyvale, if you come into the library, there are two computers devoted to patent and trademark research that you can do right there. We also have backup um, electronic disks if for some reason those computers went down or mm -hmm. all the computers, well, if all the computers went down, <laughs> I guess you couldn't problem. get those either. <laughs> but if you couldn't for some reason access it on the internet. Okay. Um, that's one thing we have. Also, we've 
at a patent and trademark depository library, the personnel have been trained at the patent and trademark office through their training program. And they also have, they can refer people to the patent and trademark office or from the patent and trademark office. So if you oh, came to okay. us, for example, with a question mm -hmm. that we couldn't answer, we may be able to refer you directly somewhere else, oh. but we may also be able to get some kind of help through our program office. Oh, great. Now, at Sunnyvale, we're very, very lucky. We have a volunteer who's worked with us 10 years now. Um, and he's there Monday through Friday from 10, at least from 10 to 12. And he will demonstrate a patent search for people if they oh, come great. in. Now, how long has Sunnyvale been a um, uh, patent and trademark depository library? I think it's been since 65. 65, wow. It's been in different locations. Uh, but uh, the, the library the, itself. Oh, the library itself. And okay. it, it, the first collection actually started in a garage, I understand. Oh, so. <laughs> oh well, that's um, great. very yeah. interesting. So um, if someone then... In, in the community is interested in um, for their business from either um, uh, copyrights or patents or trademarks then they have a resource to go to here in, in the Sunnyvale Library to be able to come in and speak to someone who uh, can help them with that uh, that research and can refer them to um, other sources. I think you mentioned a couple of books to me at one point that were very useful. There are wonderful uh, NOLO Press books. There's one on patents and one on trademarks. Okay. Patent It Yourself by David Pressman is excellent for patenting. There's also something called Patent Pending in 24 Hours. We haven't gotten into this, but there is something called a provisional application mm -hmm. that people might be interested in. The trademark book from NOLO Press is also wonderful. Trademark, legal, um, legal Care for Your Business and Product Name mm -hmm. by Stephen Elias. Okay. And it's wonderful. Um, the one thing I didn't mention yet is that on the Patent and Trademark Office website, anyone can go and look up a patent attorney. For example, if you've had a patent attorney recommended to you, mm -hmm. it's a good idea to look at that website and to make sure that that person is registered to practice before the Patent and Trademark Office. Ah. You can also look up an attorney perhaps just to get an idea who you might go to. You can look under zip code or city. So if you're, so, so uh, an attorney would have to be registered uh -huh. with the uh, Patent and Trademark Office, is that the idea? They're registered by the Patent, patent and, and Trademark, trademark office. office to practice before the Patent and Trademark oh, Office. Fantastic, very And agents are also registered. Okay. Well, Marjorie, I really appreciate your coming this, this evening. This has been tremendous, and I hope that our viewers have learned some things, too. This has been very, very uh, great. And uh, is there any last comment that you might have? We have a few seconds left before we have to end off. Well, just one more thing. The Sunnyvale Public Library also offers programs, not only on patents and trademarks. We have several of those. And also on basic business research, including a little bit of intellectual property in that. And then, of course, we have programs for all the general public, adults and children. Great. Well, thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, we appreciate your coming to see us here at Reference Point. See you next time.